Welcome to Epilogue Podcast, the show where we discuss some stuff that happened on a different show ages ago which nobody really cares about anymore. Hi, I'm Port Ponky. And I'm Lovelock. Today, we are discussing Farscape, Season 3, Episode 2, Sons and Lovers. Amidst a terrorist attack on a space station, the crew must put their personal issues aside to survive. I'm going to guess you liked this episode. Why are you guessing that? Because... It seems like the last we will see of Jothi. <laughs> Surprise, yeah, I like this episode. But not just for that. Okay, I was going to ask, aside from that, um, a lot goes on in this episode. It's quite dense. It does a classic Farscape thing of throwing you right in and not really relenting pretty much all the way through. There's good character stuff in here, too. And the episode succeeds despite having Aaron in a tunnel the whole time. Is that a bad thing? Yeah, she doesn't get to do anything cool. She just stumbles around a tunnel the whole time. The whole time? She was about to whip her top off and flash the world. And then she fell down a hole. Did you find that surprising, by the way? That she fell down a hole? Or that well, she's... <laughs> both, I guess, both. <laughs> the conversation that led up to that surprised me. I didn't see Aaron saying, yeah, let's have sex if you want. Who cares? Humans are very hung up about that issue. And she's acting like she's not. I enjoy reminders that we as humans have certain societal expectations and they aren't universal. So these reminders are helpful and help you see that, that just because we behave in this manner doesn't mean other people would just naturally develop that way. For an episode with a considerable death toll and a lot of peril, they did fit quite a lot of sex in. <laughs> they were really going for everything here. It starts off with Rigel being a pervert and <laughs> watching Gianna. Uh, a, a pervert in the criminal sense, I would guess. I don't understand quite what the point of that is for him because he has said that he is not a body breeder. Uh, it gives him power in having that knowledge, and power is delightful to Rigel, to anyone. I don't really question it because he's despicable and he's doing something awful again, so that's good old Rigel. <laughs> Well, he does despicable things to further his personal agenda. And I could see him enjoying having this information because he can hold it over Chiana. And it could mean the expulsion of both of them. And if there are fewer crew members and if they come upon treasure, that's more for him. They don't have to divide it as much. Uh, I think he's just a poet. Yeah, let's go with that. Uh, all right, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to deconstruct this logically, I guess. Uh, let's go by character groups. So if we're on uh, Chiana, Jothi, Dargo, Dargo is a very sad guy. Lots of crying. And he sort of dies. He doesn't die, he just gets zapped a bit. Yeah, we're led to think he died, but he didn't. Everyone is going to die or sort of die. We've already had Aaron and 
Dan, now Dargo. So they're all taking their turn. They are leaning a bit heavily on this kind of idea. It's a bit sad for Dargo because he dreamed of meeting his son for ages and then it turns out he had absolutely nothing in common with his son. That's a good lesson not to idealize things that are outside of our control. It, he didn't think, hey, what if my son is terrible? Which was an option and turned out to be true. Uh, yeah, yes. That is one way to look at it. <laughs> I'm not trying to be a Jothy uh, supporter. He's okay. I don't mind him that much. This episode solved a problem I had. The biggest problem I had with Jothy in that... Or I had several problems. One of the biggest problems I had with <laughs> Jothy is that I could not believe that Chiana would find him attractive and want to be with him. It didn't make sense for her character. But then the reveals in this episode make so much sense. She's getting to a place with Dargo that's too serious and she didn't know how to handle it. And she acted out uh, physically and she was knowingly using him. That makes way more sense to me than what it appeared to be on the surface. When you say acted out, that's assuming monogamy is the default. I don't I don't want to just say she's promiscuous, but she certainly uh I don't want to say hedonistic either, but kind of more like free. Yeah, that's fair. Whereas Dogo certainly seems very monogamous. And only, more direct in communication. Only been dating six months and they're pretty much dating by consequence and he's already talking about buying a farm <laughs> <laughs> buying a farm by the way that's a euphemism for dying is it yeah he bought the farm not very common but there you go interesting i don't know if that bears any relevance to this well, he sort of said it, and he sort of died. He didn't die, though. He was just zapped a bit for a while. He was trying out death. He was just not caring. <laughs> he wasn't going, hey, I will absolutely kill myself 100%. He was more kind of like, well, this needs to be done. <sighs> Whatever happens, happens. You know, throwing caution to the wind, because he was kind of a little bit sad he was inviting death just a bit they had a whole episode about this um uh taking the stone where Chiana had to jump down the hole and that episode kind of justified it and kind of didn't so i think we have the same idea here that's my take on it anyway if he was truly suicidal why would he tie a rope back to the airlock Good point. It confused me when John was shouting at him, shouting at Dargo to wait for John. I didn't understand what they could do together differently to solve that problem. It seemed like those things needed to be put together and whoever did it would, was in danger's way. They could hold one each and waggle them from a distance. I think John just wanted to make sure Dargo wouldn't jump into the star or something. <laughs> Not that you could jump into a star from there. Dargo could. Uh, you would need a huge amount of um, acceleration to reach the star. Orbital mechanics. I say that, what I really mean is Kerbal Space Program. Moving on to what's the next characters? Uh, let's pick Stark and Zan. They didn't really do very much, but they were there. Stark had a little mini freak out where he shouted at Zan, let me look at it now. I, just that one line, 
I guess it's probably weird that it's that line, but that line made me love Stark. I like these outbursts of his and how unpredictable he is. It's ambiguous. He spends a lot of the time playing up how insane he is, but sometimes... Uh, well, I, I was going to say sometimes the mask slips, but he had to <laughs> wear a mask that sometimes slips. But uh, yeah, sometimes we see that there is real madness hiding inside him, and it is ambiguous how much of an act it all really is. I think you've touched on why I've I've grown to love him. He started off as this totally insane person and then said, ha, oh, no, that was all an act. And then he came off as this calming presence. And then we realize over time it's a mixture of the two and he can change at the drop of a mask. Sorry. <laughs> he could go from one to the other. He's unpredictable. And Zan's head is very sticky. Yeah, it's pretty gross. She probably shouldn't have worn that hood for so long. She needs some ointment. Yeah, she should take care of that. Also, she claims to be terminally ill, still. <laughs> claims? You think she's <laughs> faking it? <laughs> it is the definition of terminal, I guess. Surprise, I'm not actually dying. I just <laughs> wanted some attention. I, I, yeah, so I should say Zan is still terminally ill. Again, terminal. So, um, Stark thinks he'll save her. She'll survive. I say that because they're dragging it out. Usually, if you drag something out, the person lives. Because otherwise, the audience can feel cheated if they invested so much in this character and then they ultimately die. So your theory on terminal illness on TV is that generally people survive it? Yeah, so there are miracle uh, there are miracle cures all the time in TV shows. I can't think of any example one way or the other. Me but either. I, I just threw that right. out there. Yeah. Some stuff pops to mind. Okay. Well, that's them. Like I said, they didn't get up to much. Uh, let's say John, Aaron, uh, Mordal, and Borlick. I really like Mordal. I like looking at his face. It's an interesting face. The big spider guy. Yeah. That's uh, Thomas Holsgrove. Again. But I think that's the first time it's his actual voice. Yes, that's his actual voice. So Thomas Hol Holsgrove is a um, actor that often plays uh, larger, like taller aliens, especially ones who have very heavy prosthetics. I think he's played every single Scarron. And uh, like he was the diagnosis in Tokot. And here he was a spider Russian. Yep. I like how he died before he gave the code rather than after. Uh, yeah, that's so tiring. When, uh, here's the code, now I'm dead. What about Bor Borlick? Which one is Borlick? The, the lady with the oh. magnetic body. That was strange. Uh, strange how? How her magnetism worked. Magnetism has different forms. There's real magnets. Um, and space magnets? Not space, it's television magnets. And then there's video game magnets, which work differently. They all work different. Television magnets have like a will of their own. So they will only magnetize to usually things that are also on camera. And they can work over a much longer distance and they'll often make a kind of electric hum when they magnetize. <laughs> yeah. Saying that they do have a rather novel 
solution to the magnetic problem? The first time or the second time? The well, I certainly like the second solution better. I didn't quite see what they were going with with the first one. Like if a magnet is stuck to something and you introduce a bigger thing, what happens is the bigger thing also gets stuck to the magnet and the first thing. And then all three things are stuck together. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a space magnet. And it's, it was a space television magnet. And it was a alien space television magnet? Not even... She was a person. I presume she ate a magnet. <laughs> or had it surgically implanted, <laughs> rather. That might make more sense. Pilot was in this episode, and he did a couple things. He was useful. He nearly made a big mistake. When? He was about to starburst, and John corrected him. Well, he identifies as being terrible at his job. He has to live up to that expectation. Even, even given that, I think this is the first time he's made an outright blunder. He was due. Yeah, he, yeah, he probably was. He also pretty much killed someone. And laughed maniacally. He's due a kill as well. He's he doesn't often get the chance. He felt left out until yeah, now. Well, how was what are the body counts of everyone else? They're pretty pretty high, I would imagine. He's lacking behind on the scoreboard. He has a lot of work to do to catch up. There was a bunch of stuff in this episode that you may have missed because there Probably. was so much going on. So I didn't miss that guy vomiting. Yeah, the Interion, one of the Interions was awakened, spoke to Jothy, and then horribly died. <laughs> <laughs> I love Jothy's line. I think this guy's dying. Yeah. Jothy is a genius. Uh, they still have the other Interion still frozen. After that one Interion died and later Dargo is in there and he says, what's that smell? I thought for sure it was going to be about the smell of the puke or at least have yeah. it mentioned. It's vomit. That would be a likely candidate. It's very smelly usually. <laughs> yeah. Dargo found a ship. Wait, he did? See, so much goes on in this episode. Yeah, he finds a ship floating in the debris of the space station and takes it on board, and then they're looking at it later, and it's got a like a oh, shield yeah. around it. Yeah, and he touches it, and it ripples. Yeah, it's pretty cool. The first time I watched this show, I completely missed that bit where he finds the ship. I mean, I guess not missed, maybe like you, it just was littered amongst the details of this episode. Had you not mentioned that, I would... It slipped my mind. It's pretty cool. Also, pretty useless. For now. For now, yeah. Um, one other little cameo. Uh, the DRD with one eye, which they call one eye, <laughs> was the one Stark was holding. Remember that guy? You've brought him up before and I forget why I'm supposed to remember him. Something early on with John. Jo yeah, John fixes him with tape in the pilot episode in premiere. Okay. Yeah, saying pilot episode is a little confusing with this show. Yeah. I feel like this episode could have been a two-parter because so much stuff went on, but it wouldn't have really added anything. I'd uh, rather a single episode feel dense than a two-parter feel overly long. Yeah. I feel like in other shows, this kind of thing with a big destroyed space station, which, by the way, looked incredibly cool, would have been a two-parter, but only to handle it at a slower pace. I don't seem to mind just cranking the pacing way up on Farscape. 
And in a way, I think this episode suffers slightly for it. It's you get a bit too saturated with what's going on. That ship that Dargo finds is a good example that gets lost in the shuffle. Yeah, and that is something that I imagine will show up later. It would be weird if it didn't. It wouldn't even be weird because no one remembers it. (laughs) I guess what I'm trying to say is that I think they overextended themselves a little bit with this episode. I think that's fair to say. In a good way, though. They made it too exciting. (laughs) It's like the opposite of an episode being boring. It's just it's too jam-packed with stuff. Like, all that stuff about Aaron rescuing the kids. What did that really add, particularly? Nothing. It just kept Aaron occupied. Had her sneaking around in tunnels, hearing distant children, which is pretty terrifying. Yeah, children are scary and unsettling. Especially when they're at a distance. No, it's worse when they're right by you. No, it's worse when you're walking around and you can hear them far away. Like, help me. The threat of children. You can't get to them. I wouldn't really say threat, but yeah, sure. (laughs) Do you have a quote from this episode which you would like to share? Repent, we have less than an arm. I was a dominar. Take me longer than that to repent. (laughs) Rachel does get the majority of the really good lines. It's a little unfair. Is it unfair? Oh, you mean on everyone else? Yeah. My quote selection is probably Rigel heavy. I haven't tallied him up, but he's so quotable. He gets a lot of the best one-liners because that's a good way to give him a strong character on the show considering his uh, physical, not just the fact that he's small, but the puppet work required to fit him into a scene can be complicated, so they don't want him getting sidelined. That's my theory, anyway. He's a small guy, so they gave him a larger-than-life personality to average it out. This... Line is funny, but I actually don't like it. You don't? I don't think Rigel would see anything he's done as bad. He would justify it in his head and think he's acting rightly. Um, I think to some extent he is aware that he got away with a lot as a dominar. But that's the job of a dominar. Sure. He can objectively look at what he's done, though. I think he's the kind of guy who does think of himself as a little bit devious. I think he's become aware of it because of this crew and how they constantly challenge him and tell him he's terrible. Perhaps. He hasn't changed much since the start of the show. No, he hasn't changed, but now he knows what, how he's perceived. I think he might be a bit of a sociopath. Yeah, a bit. It seems to be working for him. Kind of. He's gotten this far. He's, he's gotten this far. Ignore the fact that he's reprehensible and commits horrible acts on his friends pretty much every episode. He he does save their lives from time to time. I'm surprised they didn't have anything small for him to go into in this episode. Mm -hmm. Usually, especially earlier on in the show, that when there was an emergency situation, there'd be something small that only Rigel could go into to include him into the plot. They've eased back on that. Unfortunately, I like seeing Rigel squeeze in the little vents and things. It's, yeah, it was fun. Um, I understand that impulse, I, though. I could yeah. see the writers saying, we are leaning way too heavily on this. Let's ban it. Never have Rigel squeeze in the holes again. It, you don't want to make him into a gimmick character. No, the that would be really bad. Angry little guy who fits in the small tube right in the middle of a crisis and says, I don't want to go in the tube. I would like 
Rigel to have that line before anyone even suggests it. He just assumes he'll be shoved into some <laughs> tube. Maybe in the next episode that will happen. Let's watch it and find out. Okay. Okay.